Welcome again to everyone. Welcome to everyone on Zoom. We are going to be uh, trekking through the Gospel of John, and we are in John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14. And we are going to actually uh, review our, our verse from last week as well, which was just one verse, don't worry. Um, because that's also part of this teaching as well today, which is, if you love me, this is John chapter 14, verses 15, and we're going to go to verses 31. So if you'd like to join along, you can open your Bibles there. And Jesus says uh, to his disciples here, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then verse 16, where we shift gears here in terms of, 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 of our, uh, our theme of thought, uh, supposedly, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may be with you forever, and that is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, I will not leave you as orphans, verse 18, I will come to you. After a little while, you will no longer see me, but the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Verse 20, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. Now, Judas, not Iscariot. This is another one of the disciples. It's actually also named Thaddeus. If you've seen that Judas, not Iscariot said to him in verse 22, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? What's going on? Verse 23, Jesus answers him and says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we will make our abode, our dwelling place with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Now, this is verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while abiding, dwelling with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to you in my name, he will teach you all things. And he will bring to remembrance everything that I've said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Remember, he started this whole thing by saying that. You heard that I said this to you. I go away and I will come to you. Now, if you love me, you would be rejoicing because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Now, I've told you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. Now, I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. I know that's a long chunk. It's a lot to chew. We're not going to dissect every word for it because the reason is, is because a lot of the stuff that's in what we just heard, Jesus has been saying to his disciples throughout. We've covered a lot of the detail, but there is a very important aspect to this passage. Now, again, we have to review a little bit just so we can bring our mind to where we're at. Let's not just take the scripture and just start to think about what it and how it applies, but what's going on here? What time is it? Well, it's Passover time. The spirit in the air of renewal, rebellion even, restoration. God is going to come and save us at some point. He promised to send his Messiah. That's what's going on is this Passover meal. It's also one day before Jesus is about to go to the cross. We know that in the last, last week, we talked about that one scripture. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And we took this and we, 
we sort of saw how it echoed that of the Passover and that echoed that of Moses on his very last day comes before his people who are about to go into the promised land. He wrote the whole, the whole book of Deuteronomy is basically Moses' last day on with his people. And we saw how that paralleled to Jesus, his last day with his people. Moses said, you need to obey the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And of course, Jesus is summarizing that too. The Shema. Love me and obey my commandments. Powerful for Jesus to say this. And as Jesus was standing there on the border of the promised land, about to go to the cross, about to initiate the kingdom, about to deal with sin, about to initiate freedom, so was Moses doing the same thing. And neither of them actually got to cross in, physically, that is, until Jesus raises from the dead, showing that he is much greater, not only much greater, but he is God. He told them who he was by that one little verse. He told the disciples who they are. They're the new Israel getting ready to go into the promised land. And he also told them what they're about to do by standing at that border. You are about to go out and you are about to go in, not only just to the promised land, but to the whole entire world, fulfilling that which was promised to Abraham, that all the world in every family would be blessed because of Abraham's capital S seed, Jesus. And so we have the launching pad here of the kingdom of God, the launching pad, just as Moses was standing at the border about to have Joshua go in and take the land, Yahshua, God is salvation. We have Jesus, God is salvation, the Hebrew or the Greek name or the uh, transliteration of Yahushua, which is Jesus, which also means God of salvation, standing, telling his people what is about to happen. So with all that said, we now, in this passage, we learned about the what last week. Now we are going to learn about the how. In this passage, he explains how they are going to do it, how they are going to succeed in the kingdom and in the promised land as joyful image bearing believers taking the gospel, not just to one small area, but to the entire world. <clears throat> now, wouldn't it be great if right now, as we're standing here worshiping, we heard the, the, the thundering and the rumbling of the cloud of the Lord descending down upon our church. Wouldn't it be great that as if we decided to meet in the day, he, he came down as a, in a cloud and he met with us. If we, if we gathered in the evening, he shows up in a pillar of fire. It would be fascinating, wouldn't it? In all reality, it would probably be pretty terrifying. As we read uh, the summary that Kevin read this morning, about throughout all their journeys, all of the journeys of the Israelites through the wilderness, <clears throat> the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God by day, and the fire came down by night in the sight of everyone. Now, when Moses met with God on Mount Sinai, there was not only a cloud of smoke, there was thunder and lightning, and God warned Moses, said, look, don't let anybody break through this cloud and try to take a look or else they shall perish. So when the people saw that cloud come down, God's presence come down, they were very careful. He guided the Israelites through all of their wanderings with this cloud and with this fire, despite the fact that they were rebellious people. He was faithful to his covenant. I used to wonder why none of this ever terrified Moses. He used to enter the tent. He would, the cloud would descend and he would go in and speak to God. The cloud would be at the entrance of the tent and Moses would speak to the Lord. So much so that when Moses came back from speaking with the Lord, people were terrified of Moses because his face would glow from being in the presence of the Lord. 
Exodus 34, 29 to 30. Now, I tell you this because you may think, well, yes, that was the Old Testament. But I'm telling you today that God showed us that in the Old Testament because that is a picture of what God did by sending the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. For the Holy Spirit to descend on the new tabernacle of God. For the baptism of fire, as Jesus was told, as John tells us that, I baptize you with water, but he, Jesus, will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, in our flesh, we're unable to be in the physical presence of God because of his unimaginable holiness. It's not his fault. It's our fault because we have sinned. That's why we can never look and be in the Lord's presence. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we wouldn't have to be terrified of being in God's presence. As a matter of fact, it is now a joyful, amazing experience to be a Christian and have the presence of the Lord in us. It's amazing. Why? Because God has dealt with the sin in us. You may not know that. We're going to talk about how to get over that today. But he has cleaned us so that he can live in us and dwell in us in purity. He promises the Holy Spirit in this passage to be our comforter and to be with us for a short period of time. No. For a few years. No. Until the time we die. No. Forever, he promises to be with us, to fully give us his fiery presence. So today we're going to take a look on how the Holy Spirit not only seals us and guides us, but how his indwelling power enables us to serve victoriously in the kingdom of God and live the Christian life with joy, regardless of your circumstances. No matter what's going on right now in your life, I believe God wants you to listen, especially if you're going through issues, problems, trials. Maybe it's physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is. I believe God wants you, especially if you're a Christian, to tune in and listen to what his promises are. Now, first of all, maybe some of you are unfamiliar, but who is this Holy Spirit? Is it a, is it, is it something, is it some sort of, um, I don't know, ghost that floats around? Is it an entity? Is it a, a movement, a momentum? No. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth, the comforter, the advocate, the counselor. It is a person. He is a person. The third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Fully God. Now, I'm not going to go into adopt the doctrine of the deity of the Holy Spirit, but I will go to the very easy verse of Acts 5, 3 to 4. When Ananias and Sapphira came and lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter said, because they, they, they lied about the price of the land that they kept back. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit is one with Jesus and God. One example is that Jesus says in this passage that we just read, that who will send the Holy Spirit? The Father will come and send the Holy Spirit to you. We just read about that in verse 26. But if you go to John 15, 26, you don't, you don't have to go there, or John 16, 7, Who's the one, excuse me, sending the Holy Spirit then? Jesus sending the Holy Spirit. We also see that the Holy Spirit is called the helper. In Greek, it's parakletos. Para, we know, means with. Kletos means helper. Eleazar, that's the meaning Eleazar in the Hebrew. As we know, Eleazar was, was Isaac's helper, I believe. And so it's the helper that comes along with us, but this also can be translated advocate, and we see in John 1, verses 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1, 
my little children, I, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, <clears throat> we have a paracletos. We have an advocate with the Father. He doesn't say Holy Spirit here. He says Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we see that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God are all one yet individual personalities. They're distinct, but yet one. <clears throat> He is our advocate or attorney, you could say. He's used, as the word is counselor. <clears throat> what does an attorney do? <clears throat> an attorney comes and intercedes for us. And an attorney will come and testify for us on behalf of us. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Romans 8, 26, 27. Now in the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses for we don't know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And then a little later, he says, he searches the hearts and he knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I'm going to talk more about that. It's very important and pertinent to this scripture today. We are born of the Spirit. No man can see the kingdom of God unless he is born of the Spirit, unless he's born from above. The Holy Spirit draws us. He converts us. We live for Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are unable to follow Jesus on our own. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. I will put my spirit within them, in them and cause them to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments. We see this here. I will ask the Father in verse 16. He will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. But he says here that a little later in, in verse 17, it says, you will know him because he abides with you and he will be future in you. <clears throat> and then we also, a couple of weeks back, we, in our Wednesday night study, we talked about how the Holy Spirit also comes upon us. And empowers us as well. <clears throat> so what is John showing us in this passage? In light of the context of this passage, the fact that it's all about them getting ready to go do business without Jesus here. They're about to go out and be the people of God. They're about to go out and be the new Israel, so to speak, and do what God showed that Israel did, but on a much bigger level now for the world. He is showing us that they need the Holy Spirit, but more importantly, that we, because this is to us too, are rendered ineffective, impotent, powerless, without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Now, notice I when I do this, that's we got to pay attention. Power. Okay. That's a key word in today's sermon. Because you may say, well, Pat. You know, I believe, and I believe, so therefore I have the Holy Spirit. I know that for a fact. Isn't that enough? No, it, it, you do. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But possessing power and implementing power are two different things. Just as somebody's authority can be usurped or bypassed illegally or by force, so can power. So it is with the spirit. It amazed me to learn that according to a study by the Northeast Group LLC, which is a group that studies all different types of, of markets a, a lot and produces all different types of statistics, said that the world, excuse me, loses $89.3 billion annually to electricity theft. 83 point or 89.3 billion. Electricity is usurped or bypassed all throughout the world. Meters are manipulated, lines are bypassed. The electric company possesses the power, it sends out the power, but it's bypassed. It's usurped by an enemy, an illegal force. You see, God has designed it that he gives you the Holy Spirit so that you have power to live the Christian life 
and become more like him and to have joy in the Christian life. Technically, on paper, a, a joyless Christian should be an oxymoron. But it does happen to all of us. We lose our joy. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you. God, the Holy Spirit. I, that's not in the text, but I'm commentating on it because that's what this means. What does the Holy Spirit work in us? Well, the Holy Spirit is to desire creating that desire for us to do the right thing and to work for his good pleasure. You see, once you sign up and you come to Christ, it becomes a partnership. You will lay down your life and the Holy Spirit will take it over and he will work with you and in you for God's good pleasure. Nothing should you serve in a perfect world, God's indwelling power in your life for his work and his glory. Now, John shows us in this passage that we are rendered ineffective without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. How? Well, in the following ways. We see very clearly that he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, we know if we love Jesus, by default, we will keep his commandments. And Jesus is also challenging them and warning them, if you, run, if you really love me, you will keep my commandments. That will be the expression of, of somebody that loves Jesus. You are, you are loving one another. You are loving God first. Jesus sums up the whole entire law with that. You see, the Holy Spirit is telling us that we are the only, he is the only chance for us to be able to obey his commandments. Because right after that, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you the helper to do this. He will be with you, the spirit of truth, and then he will be in you. You see, the Holy Spirit is the vehicle that we ride into judgment day. It's the armored vehicle. You see, once you are a believer, you get into this armored vehicle. That's straight from the day of judgment. It has come to pick you up. And it is carrying you there. And the bombs are getting blown up. The bullets are coming. The deceiver is trying to get you to stop. You know, the person with the flat tires on the road saying, help me, help me, with all the evil guys in the bushes ready to take you out when you stop. And you just keep going. Because that's the Holy Spirit. He is going to take you to judgment day. You are justified by faith. And that is that vehicle. So you're just not saved. And, hey, that's it. I don't have to do anything. No, there's work that you have to do. Not to earn credit. But the Holy Spirit is in you taking you to that judgment day. Romans 8.11 but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in him, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's the spirit who gives us life to go and live for God. This is why he says at the end of this in 828, we know that God causes all things to work for good to those who love God. Because you are in that armored car. It's, you are getting there. You are going to get there successfully. Amen. So he gives us this to participate and to be able to obey his commandments. And this is from, I would say, from 15 all the way to 21. He elaborates on this. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. This was a very common term at the time of Christ. An orphan, this word was for somebody that was following a rabbi and the rabbi, if he quit, it was said that he was to leave his little children as orphans. That's why Jesus says little children, and even John talks about that. So Jesus is saying, I am your teacher. I am your rabbi. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you unattended. I'm going to abide with you and in you. Now, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. 
In that day, you'll know I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. You need to meditate on that verse. It says, Jesus is in the Father, we're in Jesus, and Jesus is in, is in us. It's just this crazy, intimate conjoining together. And Jesus says, I will love that person, and I will disclose myself to him. He, the Holy Spirit, is going to come and fulfill this promise, and they are going to know, yes, this is it. But then Judas, the, the Thaddeus, goes, well, Lord, listen, why are you just saying this to us? Why don't you just reveal yourself to the whole world? And Jesus looks at the other disciples and says, did he just say that? Did he just really ask that, ask that question? It's like, isn't he not? What, is he listening or what? He didn't say that. But in verse 22 to 26, he answers him. He says, I feel like he should, John should have put, like, you know, like Martha, like what Jesus says to Martha. Come on, listen, you got you know, you, you to listen to me. He says, look, if anyone loves me, he will, what, keep my word. He's reiterating, the Father will love him. We will come to him, we, capital W, and we will make our dwelling place with him. What are you talking about? Why aren't I revealing myself to the world? That's exactly what I'm doing through you. I'm going to dwell in you. But you see, without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, not only can we not effectively obey Jesus' commands, but we cannot effectively participate and take to take the gospel to the world and build for the kingdom of God. We can't be that image-bearing witness. We can't fully recognize and even apply our calling as Christians without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. So we can't obey. We can't be that witness. In verse 27 and 28, he also tells us this. <clears throat> peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. You see, the peace that Jesus gives us isn't the peace going, oh, well, I know I'm saved, because that doesn't work. We know, we, read, we know the gospel, we know what Jesus did for us, but we still miss out on the joy, the peace of the Lord. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot have, without the power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot have a joyful Christian life. You will have a miserable Christian life. You will have a Christian life of doubt and worry. A Christian life of constantly wondering what's going to happen. I don't trust the Lord in this. I don't know. I do. I'm supposed to trust him, but I don't trust him. You see, but with the Holy Spirit, we have all these things. <clears throat> so I have two questions for you. My first is did you receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, you will see him and know him. When you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell in you. However, you don't have the Spirit's indwelling power without first having the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit to have this power in you. So if you don't have the Spirit, if you haven't believed, makes no sense. You can have the Spirit's indwelling power without first having the Spirit, but you can have the indwelling Spirit and not have or manifest His power. I'm going to say that again. You can have the Spirit's indwelling power without first, I'm sorry, you can have the Spirit's indwelling power without first having the Spirit, but you can have the indwelling Spirit and not manifest its power. How do we know if we receive the Holy Spirit and we've seen the Holy Spirit? And we know, very simple, are you of God or are you of the world? Jesus said, look, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is foolishness to the world. Walking around with a joker hat on. It's about how you look to the world if you talk about the Holy Spirit. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2.14. They are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand him. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. 
And a person that does not have the spirit of God is still in their original state of deadness. <clears throat> they need to be made alive. The second thing is, is, have you heard and understand the truth? Because the Bible says he is the spirit of truth. <clears throat> he is not the spirit of feeling. He is not the spirit of happiness. He is not the spirit of goosebumps. He is the spirit of truth. See, feeling does not produce truth. You can't, through feeling, prove to me that that statement is true. Feeling does not produce truth. The word of God is the absolute standard that produces fruit. Listen to Romans 6, <clears throat> 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you have come obedient from the heart to that sort of feeling? No, to that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And after being freed from sin, you become slave to righteousness. So how do we know? We listen to the word of God. We think, think. We ought to think and use the mind that God has given us to understand and comprehend. We must not just feel, although that will come. Okay, it's, it's, it's understanding first, and then comes potentially the feeling. People must hear and understand and perceive and then believe and confess. How are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher preaching the truth of God? So the spirit of truth is in you. You know that what I am telling you is true. Not because you just have a feeling, but because your mind that God has given you, you've been made in the image of God. You're able to think that through and understand it. You may not understand every doctrine or all the whys, whys. But you know that you know that it's true because you have the Holy Spirit in you. And we could say a lot more about that at another time as it relates to why the Bible is ultimate truth. And why it is the only thing that is the absolute standard. And why it is that because of the impossibility of the contrary. Which we will hopefully talk about one day. But for now, if you've received him... You've seen him and you know him. <clears throat> okay, so my second question is to Christians. My second question to you is, why do you think, if you are a Christian who has the Spirit of God abiding in you, indwelling in you, you are unable to experience the power of the Spirit in your life? Why? You're a Christian. You have the Spirit in you, but you're not. You're not able to obey. You're not seeing obedience. You're not effective in the kingdom. You're lacking joy. You're up. You're down. Your circumstance is good, and I'm good. Circumstance is bad. What's going on? Why is that? And you're just this big roller coaster, and you just say, I just, I'm just walk in faith, and hopefully God will open my eyes. Well, here's today. Hopefully this opens your eyes. You see, this means that you have the knowledge of the Spirit dwelling in you. And in fact, you do have the Spirit in you, Christian. But something is usurping the power from being made manifested in your life. Something is usurping the power for you to be able to obey. Something is usurping the power from you being effective in the kingdom. Something is taking the power away, and you're miserable almost all of the time. You're lacking joy. Why is this happening? If we possess the spirit of God with us, there's only one reason. And it's not because God is indwelling in us. It's because we are quenching the Holy Spirit. What does quenching the Holy Spirit mean? Well, we know in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul specifically says, don't quench the spirit. <laughs> Quenching is a word that means... <clears throat> extinguishing a fire fires lit starts to light up and out 
The power in your life, fire gets up, ineffective. Fire gets lit, water, powerless, fruitless, weak, profitless. Spirit is extinguished, completely gone. Are you saved? Yes. Will you see God? Yes. Will you be forgiven? Yes. Are you living for Christ as he wants you to live? No. Because you're extinguished. You're, you're taking the fire out. And that's not what God wants. He wants your joy to be full. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to go out and, and be a part of what this project that he is doing in this world to renew it and restore it and bring in the new creation. He wants you to be able to obey him, to love one another, to not have to be up and down with your relationship in and out of the shadows. He doesn't want any of that for you. He's giving you the Holy Spirit and the word of God so that will not happen. But it still does. It happens to me as well. I'm not talking up here as somebody who's mastered this by any chance, by any stretch of your imagination. But these are the things that get me through these times that I'm going to share with you now. Because I want you to know, how do we quench this spirit? Well, I think verse 24 tells us, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. You see, I believe that the number one quencher of the Holy Spirit is disobedience. Now, I am not trying to tell you this to guilt you into trying to pull yourself up from your own bootstraps and say, okay, I'm going to start obeying now, and I'm going to really shape up, and I'm going to really do all the right things, because then I'm going to be good. You know what Paul says? That's only going to stimulate more sin. That's why the law was given. The law was given so that the trespass would increase and become exceedingly sinful. Because the more we start to sit there and try to live the straight life in our own flesh, the more sin goes, oh, guess what's going on? Let's take advantage of this. We're unable to do it. But at, but at the same time, shall we sin because grace abounds? Never. So what is the answer? I'm going to give it to you in a second. Ephesians 4.30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so this grieving and this quenching, I believe, is related. So before I tell you how, I want to tell you what. This is what it is. Bitterness. I'm not going to be bitter anymore. I'm not going to be bitter anymore. I'm going to try not to be bitter. No more bitterness. No more bitterness. Oh, I'm so bitter. Wrath. All right, I'm going to control myself. Anger, I'm not going to get angry anymore. I'm going to do it. I'm doing fine. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Okay, good. Stop that right now. Right? That's what happens. Clamor, slander. It all must be removed along with malice. Why does it happen? It happens because we're doing it in our flesh. We're saying, if I obey, then I'll be blessed. If I obey, then I'll be blessed. No, 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 no. I am blessed. You see, that's the key. I can walk out, drop the mic, and leave now. If you can just get that. And really understand what it means to be blessed and really understand who you are in Christ and what Jesus did for you, then you know what? You would be able to get through these sins that extinguish and quench and grieve the spirit. We'll talk about this and we'll come into a come circling in for a landing here. How else do we quench it? Through a troubled, worried, an untrusting mindset toward life and toward God. We don't trust God. We do not trust him. We do not trust his sovereignty. We do not trust that what's going on in our life right now, including the sins that we are trapped in, is part of God's plan. Trust him. I'm not giving you a ticket for those sins. You're not going to get me on that. But you must know that he is in control. Your eyes are not on the Lord and his providential control of your life. Your eyes are on what you have to do. What I have to pick up myself. I got to straighten up all this. I got to do all this. I got to do that. 
You see, <clears throat> here's another mic drop, okay? Here's the other secret. Love God. Love God. Instead of focusing on your sin and your anger and your wrath and your bitterness and all that other stuff, when you get those thoughts in your mind, you stop those thoughts and you focus and you take that thought and you put it in a rear naked choke, you take it captive and you give it to Christ and you just love God because those sins are not accounted against you any longer, ever. They can't be. But yet we let them destroy us. We let them worry us. We let them cover us and hold us down. But yet they were rendered dead at the cross. You are crucified with Christ. Literally, you are, have died with Christ at the cross. And where does sin dwell? It dwells in our flesh. That flesh has been nailed to the cross. So although it is still active and it still thrives up, what makes it thrive up? Trying to be that, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. No, focus everything on loving God and Jesus Christ. You put your whole, everything, your mentality, you don't let the devil take those thoughts and bring them over here and get you thinking about all the lust and all the sin that you're doing, all the, all the struggles that come in your mind and you're just going to God, oh God, forgive me, oh God, forgive me, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, but you're forgiven. Love Christ. Sweep it out and go and love Christ. I believe this right here, and this culminates to, to everything I'm saying culminates to this point. This is the, I believe, and I've hinted at it, quenching the power of the Holy Spirit is through misunderstanding the gospel. Do we really understand what Jesus did at the cross as it relates to this freedom that I'm talking about? <clears throat> You know, <clears throat> Jonathan is a, a reptile expert. He got me a, a get, he got Ezra a, le, a lizard. I love, we love lizards. Her name is Dallas. She's a leopard gecko. One of my favorite things is to see Allie eat crickets. It's so cool. We get the biggest ones that we possibly can get. They're literally probably, I don't know, a third of her body. Length. They're huge. And she loves to eat these crickets. My wife loves having the crickets in the house. We get crickets in the mail. We got a hundred crickets in the mail in this little container. We put them in the, this basket and uh, we, we keep them uh, in our upstairs. And we hear, we hear crickets in my house all the time, but they're never out of the cage. Uh, one time they all fell out. The one time I dropped the cage full of crickets. It was all over. And so I went to war with crickets for about an hour. But why I'm telling you this is because when I get that new container of crickets in the mail every two weeks, there's none left alive in that cage other than one cricket. Now, when I go to feed Allie, I open up the crickets. When I first get the crickets and they're all alive, I open up the lid and they try to jump out. They're always trying to get out. But at every time, every two weeks, when I get the new batch in, there's only about one left amidst all these other dead ones in there because they don't all live. And I take it outside now and I do it. And I just look at that cricket that's left in there and I open up that lid. And do you know he never tries to jump out? He never tries to jump out. And I say, wow, should I take this guy and throw him in the cage? I'm just, he's, he's not jumping out. Do you know why he's not jumping out? Because the lid is off. I want him to jump out. I'm going to let him go. I have respect for that guy. He flew from Tennessee in some car. He lived two weeks in a cage with all these other crickets, all these other dead bodies around him. He has a chance to jump out, and that sucker will not jump out. Even though the lid is off, even though freedom has been given, even though he's out of bondage, he's still stuck in the mindset that there's a lid. And so what do I do? I give him grace, and I go and I just dump him out. He starts to run. And I say, wow, that guy came from Tennessee, from some cricket farm. Probably thought his life was going to be over. Probably thought he had no hope. He lived his whole entire life thinking he had no hope. Everything's wrong. I'm going to get eaten by, the, by Allie. I'm going to die of dehydration. I'm going, to get, I'm going to die amongst all these other dead bodies. And then all of a sudden, here comes Pat, looking for a sermon analogy. <laughs> I dump him out. You see, 
letting what well, they'll just look at some of the animals that are let out of captivity most of them don't know a lot of times what to do when they were lit they're in captivity for their whole life and then when it's free that takes them the, you know the monkeys come out of the cage and they, they're in the wild they sit there for a while before they realize it and this is i believe a perfect picture of realizing what the gospel truly has done for us but don't wait your whole life don't live your whole life struggling, being with lack of joy, with all this stuff. You're free. You are free. I'm going to go to Romans 7, 14. Just listen to this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I hate, the very thing that I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Confessing that the law is good. So now, listen, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. You don't have the ability to do good. For good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing that I don't want, and this is scripture, we, we never think about this last part. I am no longer the one doing it. But sin which dwells in me, the sin which dwells in you is doing it. That doesn't mean I'm giving you a, a ticket here because, again, Paul constantly says, this isn't to tell you that you can go and sin. It's to tell you that the sin that is in you, that is doing that, is being, is being thrived up by your fleshly attempt to kill it. That's what it says a little before sin taking an opportunity through the commandment it deceived me and through the commandment it killed me so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good and then he says well then is, is the law the cause of my death is it wrong for me to try to do good in my own flesh no it's actually it would be great for you to try to do good but you can't it's sin in order that sin may show in order that it may be shown to be sin rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful so the more we try to obey in our own strength and we quench the holy spirit when we do that the more failure we have now, this undermines the gospel. Jesus is saying, I bore the sin on the cross for you. You were dead there with me. The sin that's raging in you was nailed to the cross. It is dead. But then how do I live, Lord? Well, it's very, very simple. You live by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Are you getting this? This is the gospel message. The gospel message is an aspect of this message is really all about the fact that we are free from the bondage of sin if we would only just stop overwhelming ourselves with this and just fully love God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what it all comes down to. Believe the truth of the gospel. Meditate on who you are in Christ. Know that it is God who is dwelling in you. Know that it is impossible for God to condemn you for any sin. Past sins, present sins, future sins, all level of sin, even really, really bad, disgusting, atrocious sin. If you're fully turned to Christ, you have the spirit and you focus on loving God, you will be free from that bondage, and you will have the Holy Spirit. You will have the joy 
And this is how we become sanctified because when we do live like this, the sin becomes less and less appetizing. What's going on? When I stopped worrying about me coming up with all the things that I have to do and I, I'm beating myself and flagellating myself every day. Now, Jesus says, look, come to me. This is why I died on the cross. You don't have to crucify yourself. You are already dead. Now, if you are dead, if you have the spirit of God, then you are sons of God. Again, this again, this is all about that big if, that conditional little word there, the conditional statement. If you're God. Now, how do you know you're God? Well, you love him. You know Christ. You know the spirit of truth. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And you focus on loving God. Focus on loving Jesus Christ. And he will then be free to release that power in you. To then live for him victoriously and joyously. And then no matter what happens, you're good. You're free. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of the gospel. What you've done for us, Lord, is so hard for us to understand and comprehend.